Hey, everybody, welcome again to another online experience here at Pinnacle Church. We're glad you are connecting with us uh, through this online medium. We started a new series last week called Back to Basics. We're going to spend eight weeks looking at the basic beliefs we need to believe about Jesus uh, to be a Christian. We're asking the question, what do we need to believe? What are the basics to be a Christian? Because I think that sometimes we can really overcomplicate the gospel, the, the simple truth of the good news of Jesus, and we can add so much to what it means to be a Christian. And we do that, it can actually end up being harmful, not helpful. And, and so we're, we're, we're studying that, we're doing that. Have, have you ever noticed, though, that sometimes... Um, when, when you uh, see a picture of something, uh, it may be a, a, a view, it may be a waterfall, it, it could be a building, a place, uh, that, that pictures um, are good, but then when you actually go to the place, when you're actually standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon or on top of a 10,000 foot peak in Colorado or somewhere, you're standing at the base of a waterfall, it is just radically different. The experience is just more that a picture is good. A video is good, but they can never fully capture the essence of what it is uh, to be in that place. You know, I think sometimes in our relationship with Jesus, uh, in our faith, uh, we are basically taking a picture. And, and what do I, what do I mean by that? We, we have lots of facts and we know doctrine and we know theology, all kinds of stuff like that. But we're not to the place where we deeply know Jesus. We know a lot about Jesus, but the question is, do we really know Jesus? And what I mean by that is there's a difference in the picture, facts about him, and the actual place of being with him in relationship. And what we're gonna look at today, if we really uh, grab a hold of this, lean into this, understand it, uh, let it, become a part of our life, uh, the belief then affects what's going on in us, um, it can take us uh, to a new place. Because see, here's the thing, I want you to get this. We don't learn the basics to have a better picture of Jesus, but to get to a new place in our relationship. with. It's good to know facts, it's good to know things, but if those are not driving you into a new place in your relationship, they're useless. It's just a bunch of facts and knowledge. And so, what we're going to look at today as we learn the basics, we're going to go just a little bit further in learning about Jesus. And it, like I said, you grab a hold of this today, it, it's, um, it's game changing. And so let's look at it. We're going to go over to John to chapter 14. Uh, we're going to start with verse 7 today, but let me give you the background of what's going on in John 14. Uh, these chapters, 14, 15, 16 of, of John, Jesus has gathered in this room. Uh, he's had the first... Uh, Lord's Supper, the first Passover with his disciples. He is talking about uh, what's going to come because uh, that later that evening, he's going to be betrayed. He's going to be turned over and he's going to be crucified the next day. And so Jesus is talking about this. He's predicting his death. And, and the disciples are a little like, what's going on? And he's talking about the Holy Spirit and there's going to be comfort. And in the context of that, right before the verses we're going to look at, uh, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the disciples are like, what? What do you mean a place? What are you talking about? He's talking about he's going, of course, to his father, going to heaven. He's going to prepare a place. And, and I saw this funny meme the other day. I, I got to share it with you. And uh, it, it was this one. It, it, do you like that? It says, is this what Jesus said? Now, when I look, one, I want to know where one of those is at. I want to know where you can get Krispy Kreme and Chick-fil-A together, right? That, I don't know, if maybe someone's playing with our emotions and that's not even real. But I saw that and I thought, yep, that's heaven to me. That's heaven to me, y'all. Some Krispy Kreme and some Chick-fil-A. But, but here's the thing, okay? That funny thing aside. In the context of that, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. And then the disciples are like, well, how do we get there? And Jesus talks about how he's the way. He's the way to the Father. And then in the middle of that, John 14, 7, look at what Jesus says. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Of course, the Father is God, the Father. And, and I want you to notice something there. Jesus says, if you know me, you're going to know God. And 
the word know there, when you, the, the Greek word for know there can be used in different ways, different contexts, just like our word knowledge can. And in this instant, it's talking about relationship and intimacy and a personal connection. So you look at that and what Jesus is basically saying there is, is this, if you have a relationship with me, you have a relationship with God. So a relationship with Jesus is a relationship with God. Jesus is saying, uh, if you want to know God, you got to have a relationship with me. I'm the way that you access God. And in the verse immediately preceding this, he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. You can't come to the Father, but through me. And that, that's the context of this. But then he goes on and he says these words. He says, from now on, you do know him. He's like, you, you have a relationship with him. You know him. You have knowledge, not just knowledge, but relationship. He's speaking to his disciples. But get this, he says, and you've seen him. Now, you're a disciple. You've been walking around with Jesus for three years. You've witnessed his miracles. You experienced this. But in your mind, you're like, you, you gravitate to that word. What do you mean seeing God? No, nobody's seen God the Father. How, how have we seen God the Father? And so look what Philip, Says Philip then says in verse 8, Philip goes on and Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. So it's like, what is Philip saying here? Philip has walked with Jesus, Philip has witnessed miracles. Philip has seen him feed 5,000 people. He's seen him heal sick people. He saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. He has seen all this stuff. He has heard him teach with authority. He has, he has just experienced all of Jesus' public ministry. He's been with Jesus in private. And, and it's like he's saying, Lord, we've seen all this stuff from you, but now, now, in this moment, can you peel the veil back? Can you show us the ultimate? Can we see the face of God. That, that's what he's basically saying there, right? Fair enough for Philip. And sometimes people look at this and think these disciples are being ignorant. Philip there is just asking a question, right? And he has a genuine need to want to grow in his faith, okay? But then notice what Jesus says. This is so important. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? It's like, it's like he's saying, come on, man. Even after I've been among you for such a long time, he's like, Philip, I've been, dude, we've been together day in, day out, 24 7, three years. You know this. You know what I'm saying. That's kind of what he's saying there. And here it comes. Anyone who's seen me, Jesus said, you see me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is like, guys, how can you say, show us the Father when? If you've seen me, you've seen him. So right there in that sentence, one of many places in the Gospels, the Gospels are the letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell the story of Jesus and his words. Jesus is literally saying, guys, you want to see God? You're looking at him. You want to see the Father? You're looking at the representation of him. And that leads to a very important point. If you want to know what God is like, you have to look to Jesus. I, I say that a lot. I, that's probably one of the top 10 things I say all the time. I'm like, if you want to understand the mind of God as far as it's possible to understand a creator, then you look to Jesus. I know some people in, in conversations with people, and there were Greek scholars that had this, and then people throughout the ages, and there are modern people that say this, but it's not really a modern thing. It's a very ancient thing. People will say, um, you know, if there is a creator and he does exist, then he would be so unknowable that we just have no way of knowing him. But the thing is, a creator does exist. I believe that. But if you created something, if you created this race of humanity and these creatures, you, you, this race that is said to be created in your image, that to be in the image of God that's had the ability to think, to create, to reason, to love, all that stuff, you wouldn't want to be absent. You wouldn't want to interact with them. And how did God finally fully interact with us? Through Jesus. You want to know what God's like? Go see what Jesus is like. You want to know what God thinks? Go see what Jesus thinks. You want to know what God says? Go see what Jesus says. You want to know how God acts? Go see how Jesus acts. 
because that's what he's saying. If you want to know God, you look to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the final full revelation of God to humanity. And then Jesus is going to go on as he talks about this, and he's going to give us some reasons why he, he can back up what he's saying. If you look, he goes on in verse 10, and he says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? He's looking at, and this is singular, and he's like, Philip, don't you have a belief, don't you have a faith that, that, that the Father and me, we are one? And, and right there, first off, in a, the one thing you can see from that is the way that we know one way we know Jesus is God is his character. Because he did nothing and he said nothing that contradicts the fact that he is God revealed to us. Now, we as Christians, we believe God is a trinity. It's this mystical, mysterious thing that we believe there's one God, one singular God, but he exists as three separate people, but yet they're one, Father, Son, Spirit. That, that's a major doctrine of Christianity. And I think, you know, you need to believe that. It's one of those basics, and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But, but his character. But not only his character, the way, he, the way he acted, he was sinless, the way he acted, but also his words. Why do I say his words? Well, look, Jesus goes on and says, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Jesus, many times when he would teach, people would, they would be amazed. They would say, he preaches as one with authority. He's not like the scribes. He's not like teachers. He's not like modern day preachers where we are preaching based on someone else's authority. We are preaching scripture. It's like this man's words have weight because they literally are the words of God. He taught with authority because he had the authority of his father. He had the authority of God the Father. And so when, when you hear Jesus speak, you know, have you ever just, I'm, I'm, I know when we, when we look at the Bible, okay, and maybe you're not a Christian, and, and okay, but, but you're a follower of Jesus, right? You're, you're a, a, a Christian. And we believe the Bible is this inspired book that we have. And it is the, it's the story of God dealing with humanity that finally culminates in Jesus. And we're going to do a whole message on that later. But we look at that book and it's all important. But have you ever stopped to ponder just for a moment? When you read the gospels, you are literally reading the very words that Jesus spoke. Andy Stanley says, it's one thing as we read the inspired texts of others, and, and it's all inspired, God breathed it, it's written by God, and, and that's important, okay? Hear me on this. But to think that I have this record of what he, he actually said, that's pretty amazing to me. And it's pretty life-changing if we grab a hold of what he said. But then another reason, right, is he goes on and he says this, he says, rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. He says, so the Father's in me, I'm in the Father, we're one, we're the same, okay? I speak with authority, and also God the Father is doing his work in me and through me. And whenever you read that word work there, oftentimes what it means is it's the miracles that Jesus accomplished, you know, why did Jesus perform all these miracles? One, he cared for people because God cares for people. But it was also a way to demonstrate, to show one way that he is who he says he is by the very acts that he did in the context of ancient Israel that he came, as we learned last week, as their Messiah, as their king, and he performed miracles to v validate his message. And so that's one way. He, go, he goes on, okay, and in verse 11, he says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, that word believe in Greek shifts, and it goes from being a singular as he's speaking to Philip to plural. It's like he's saying, hey, all y'all, you need to believe in me. And the ramification, of course, is for me and you as we read that. Believe in me, he's saying, you need to have faith, trust in the truth that I and the Father are one. I am literally God in the flesh walking among you. And then he goes on, he says, or at least, all right, at least, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. 
Look at what I've done. Look at what has happened. Look at what I've taught. Look at what I've accomplished. Believe on that. And I find it interesting that he'll say, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And he's about to accomplish the ultimate miracle, the ultimate work. Because in a few hours, he's going to go to the cross. He's going to be crucified. He's going to pay the penalty for our sin nature. And then three days later, the ultimate miracle is he's going to rise from the grave. The great Christian hope, the thing that our faith is pinned on, the historic truth, the fact, the truth that we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. To, to, culminate, to, to, to prove everything that he said is true and that he is who he claims to be, God in the flesh. And so that brings us to basic belief number two. All right, and it's this. Jesus came to demonstrate and prove what God is like. When I say, if you wanna know God, you look to Jesus and that, that Jesus is God, that's true. He came to one demonstrate through his life, through his actions and through his words to show us what God's like. But he also came to prove who God is and what God's like and he proved it through his miracles, through his life, and ultimately through his death and his resurrection. You see, we, all, we, we sometimes, as, as Christians, we, we get in this thing where we, we, we forget that, yes, we are, we are saved through his death, his resurrection, and we read his words and we grow through those, but we also are impacted and saved through his life. And that life is given to us to live. Um. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, chapter one, verse three, when I say that Jesus came to demonstrate and prove what God is like, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way. He says, the son, that's Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now, think a minute. He's saying he's the radiance of the glory of God. He's like, when you think about a sunrise and it radiates, he's saying, you and I, we can do things for the glory of God, but I, I, I am not the glory of God, okay, in that way. He's saying the son, when you, if you, if you when, think in the Old Testament, Moses, God comes by Moses, like, hey, Moses, you gotta hide out in this rock here because if you see my glory, it'll kill you, right? But then we were able to see God's glory in Jesus and it didn't kill us. He drawed us near. Now, now, and then he goes on, he says he's the exact representation of his being. When he says the exact representation, the way he's saying that, it's, it's not like he's saying, oh, he's just like um, uh, a picture. Remember, we're moving from the picture to the reality. He's like, he is the reality of it. Andy Stanley has a great quote when he was teaching on this stuff, and we've used some of his stuff for this. What if Jesus, this is Andy, what if Jesus is as close to knowing God as we get? Just think about that for a moment. There are lots of different ways that people try to interact with the divine. But what if the way to interact with the divine goes right through a relationship with Jesus Christ? If Jesus is as close as we can get to God, that, that changes stuff for all of us. And to me, when I think about that, it means that it should be a priority for me in my life to get to know Jesus. I know somebody would say, well, you know, so what? So he's God. What's that mean for me? It means everything, dude. If there is a God and he chose to reveal himself in the form of Jesus Christ to be the final full revelation of himself to humanity, then it stands to reason for me as one of those created creatures that has the capacity capability to reason, to think, and to interact, that then I need to make getting to know him a priority. It's important. Now, I know some people, maybe you're not quite there yet, will push back on what I just said because they'll say, hey, man, I've heard this. People say, well, maybe Jesus is just one way to God. Or isn't it kind of, you know, you Christians, you're, you're so exclusive with your Religion, you say, you, you, how arrogant and bigoted, I've heard this, is for you to say, 
Uh, Jesus is the way. Jesus, you have to have a relationship with Jesus to get to God. That just seems awful bigoted and narrow-minded in a world of billions of people and some of them aren't Christians. How, how can you say that? Well, here's the thing. If Jesus Christ was just another religious teacher, right? If he was just another founder of a movement who taught some good truths, if he was just another guru or another moral teacher example, then yeah, it would be pretty flippin' arrogant for all of us to say that. But if he's more than that, if he's literally the creator come in flesh, then the creator can set the rules however he wants to. And here's the thing, guys. I say this so much. You can't just say, oh, Jesus was a good teacher, a good moral example. You can't. The guy claimed to be God, and he either is or he isn't. And Jesus himself didn't believe that he was just one of many paths to God, to the divine. How do I know that? Well, you go back to the very beginning of this text in John 14, 6, listen to the words of Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. No one. He says, no one comes to God except through me. He's like, I am the way. Is it exclusive? Yes, in the sense that he is the way, but it's inclusive in that it is wide open for the entire world and anyone who will believe and put their trust and their faith in Jesus. So there it is. We've seen Jesus, as Andy says, is as close to getting, knowing God as we get, and basic belief too, he came to demonstrate and prove what God's like. And in doing that, to make a way for us to enter into relationship with God. We'll get into that more in depth in a few weeks. And so we see that. We say, okay, man, what do I, what do, I do with all this? What do I do? Well, here it is. Here's what I think we all have to do. And I've been bouncing around it the whole time. <laughs> you got to go to the gospels to get to know Jesus. If Jesus Christ is God, if he is the one who came to prove what God's like, to show us God, to live, to die, to do all that, to show us what God's like, and he is the way, then you gotta go to the gospels to get to know Jesus. Because I think what happens, here's what happens. As you go to those letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you spend time just reading through them without distraction, what will happen is, I think over time, it moves from being an interesting story to an inspired relationship. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have put your faith in him, you trust him. But as, as any relationship goes, you want to get to know the person better and better and better. That, that's what I love about being married to my wife for 31 years, and I hope God gives us another 31 if our health lasts and all that, is every day I learn something new about her, or I get to know her just a little bit better. The same can be said about Jesus. You want to know what God's like? You want to interact with the Creator who made you for a relationship? You interact with Jesus. You interact with Him. We don't have the... the, the opportunity like those disciples did to see him physically right now. But we do interact with him through the spirit, through the witness of these guys in our life. And we can interact with him on that spiritual level. He would, later on in John, he would pray that, that, that those who would come after would believe based on the testimony of these guys. And so you go to the gospels. I don't always get it right. I don't, I, my, it's an ebb and flow for me, man. Sometimes I'll go to the word and I'm just not into it. It's dry. Life gets in the way sometimes. And But the thing is, we go to the gospels, we read it and we interact and, and then we, we grow in that relationship. So I want to challenge you, okay? Because I think sometimes in this culture we live in, we have, people have certain views of, they're not quite right about Jesus, erroneous, critical. I'm like, I want to say, have you read about him? Have you literally sat down and spent the time 
set aside church hurt, set aside what you see with certain Christians. Have you sat down and tried to get to know Jesus? And here's the thing. Jesus makes it possible for us to know God, not based on what we do, not based on our effort, not based on you know how hard we read, how, how spiritual we are. We will fail if it's left to us. That's what's so good, good about the good news of Jesus. It makes it possible for us to know God based on what he has done in his death, burial, and resurrection, not based on our morality or our propensity to do better and try harder, not based on our effort. We are freed up to freely go and get to know God through the work of Jesus. And man, that to me is life changing. So I want to challenge you this week. Get alone, open up a Bible, open up your Bible app, go to a gospel, go to John. That's a good place to start. And read it. Spend some time. Take, take enough time to just read through John. And pay attention to what Jesus said, to how he treated people, to how he acted. And in that, you're going to see what God's like. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, as we uh, take this moment uh, to slow down to pause, we are grateful, Lord, that, that you loved us enough and cared for us enough to send Christ to show us the way and to ultimately demonstrate you. We're grateful, Jesus. You are our Lord. You're king, but not only are you king, you're the very creator of the universe. And it's pretty mind-boggling to me that you choose to come and hang out with your lowly creation. And we all can experience you. As we go, as we get into the Gospels, as we read, as we take the time to try to get to know you through what those men wrote who lived with you, my prayer for each of us who's watching, interacting right now is that, Lord, make yourself very real through your spirit and through your written word. In Jesus' name.